Vince, thanks for your patience. I'm really looking forward to having a real discussion around specific stocks, your strategies. And, you know, I think it's very timely. Last time I did this, we did it with Columbia Threadneedles' Sanjay Devgin, and uh, we talked semiconductors, and it was super fun getting to do the deep dive. Um, way, way too often we're doing macros, which are great and important, but um, for a guy like you, who's relatively new to the ETF marketplace as an ETF um, entrepreneur, it's fun to talk about specific holdings and do the deep dive. Um, thanks very much for joining us, Vince. Um, I think we're gonna have a real robust conversations. And um, so let's let's start here. And um, of course, you're the manager for CBSE and CBSL. And uh, congratulations on being top top um, uh, decile for CBSE. Um, tell us a little bit about your background. Let's just start right in. And um, yeah, ha happy to do that, Dan. Yeah, thanks again for having me. Um, yeah, CBSE is the is the long only select equity fund. It's actually CBLS is the uh, Change Bridge Long Short Equity ETF that I manage. Um, and I have a full list of disclosures and a prospectus and holdings on ChangeBridgeFunds.com, so folks can always reference that uh, for important information. Um, but my background in the industry now goes back about 25 years. I joined uh, initially Natixis Asset Management and various affiliates of Natixis Asset Management right into the tech bubble in the late 90s. Um, had an opportunity to learn a lot about the industry and become familiar with, frankly, the role of asset managers in portfolio management. I became enamored with that side of the business, had my Opportunity to become a research analyst, eventually portfolio manager and partner of Cloud Capital Partners, which is a Boston-based asset manager uh, where I worked for 16 years. And it was a few years ago, you mentioned, Dan, the, uh, the new entrance for me into the ETF landscape. Um, I never would have guessed, you know, candidly, for so many years in this space, I always associated ETFs with passive strategies. Um, and here I was in my career thinking a lot about portfolio construction, high active share, um, high conviction investments, you know, being able to do security analysis um, and make that product and portfolio available to investors. Um, I didn't realize all of the benefits of the ETF structures. Um, but when I began to do that homework and when the regulatory landscape changed, you know, frankly, I made ETFs a more viable option for active managers. I was incredibly excited about the prospects of that to be able to launch these strategies, you know, actively managed, more concentration, high conviction ideas, and then provide that with the liquidity and transparency and tax efficiency of ETFs. That was incredibly exciting for me in my career and personally. Um, so ChangeBridge was launched in 2020, and we got the two strategies, CBLS and CBSE, on the New York Stock Exchange uh, in the later part of that year. So now we're in year three of managing the strategies and, and I'm super excited to be here. Yeah, there's no way around it. It takes three years to create a three-year track record and it is not easy. Um, you're, you're, you're truly high conviction. You're truly um, fully transparent. And, and you know, you, every day you wear it right on the sleeve. And so I commend you for, for it because I know how hard it is. Um, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, it's invigorating. It's exciting. Um, and, you know, one of the things I'm trying to provide for our investors is accessibility and transparency. And, you know, I'm building partnerships. I mean, one of the things about the ETF structure, sometimes, you know, I think it gets associated with kind of fast money in and out and you have a theme or a ticker symbol that resonates and people can use it as a trading vehicle. Um, we're trying to do something a little bit different. I want to be a partner to investors. I want to talk about the portfolio. I want to acknowledge what worked and what didn't and how we can you know, work together to get through, uh, you know, investment cycles, hopefully add value in that process. Yeah. So, so give us a little overview on your outlook for the markets at this point. Um, we've got a lot of challenges. Some are obvious, some are not, right? Um, you've got the experience, you know, talk to us a little bit about um, what you see. Yeah. Happy to do that. And it's a great opening question, Dan, as we kind of lead into the portfolio construction process, because I do want to be market aware. I mean, at the end of the day, every security in the portfolios have been individually researched. I perform fundamental research, bottom-up security analysis. I build valuation frameworks. 
I think about price targets and risk reward, but I like entering that arena with a view on the markets. You know, this idea of, you know, where are we in the credit cycle and where are profit cycles moving? Where is capital flowing across sectors or geographies? Um, so I think that market awareness is really important, you know, as an active manager. Um, we all love the idea that you find the perfect company and you buy it and you own it forever and you buy and hold forever. Um, I certainly find companies like that where I just assume be a, a long-term shareholder and owner of the business. Um, but I think when you put that in the context of where are we in the market cycle, where are we in the economy, um, it does require a perspective on, on the capital markets. And you know, I, th I think we sit, obviously, um, you know, I don't know how consensus this is, but, but um, I suspect it's fairly highly um, you know, consensus view that we are in a slowdown. I mean, the question becomes, when do we have this landing? Is it a soft landing? Is it a hard landing? Um, and that does guide some of the portfolio construction um, process for me. I mean, I think a lot of the leading indicators um, will reveal that at some point, the US economy is going to head into a recession. We're not technically there yet. Um, you know, I think the, the no landing or soft landing cohort um, is comfortable with the idea that, look, we've, we've had this inverted yield curve, which tends to be one of the really good indicators of recessions. Um, we've had that for six, seven, eight months now, and yet the recession isn't here, right? So is the Fed coming to the rescue? Are they going to begin to lower interest rates? Is quantitative tightening really having its effect? Um, and if you look at history, inverted yield curves tend to happen eight, nine, 10, 11 months before a recession. So we're not exactly late, right? We can, we can look at leading indicators, um, and I'm reaching that conclusion, like a lot of other folks, look, we're, we're going to have to have a slowdown here in the U.S. economy to tame inflation. Um, it almost feels self-evident to me. I don't know exactly when. I can't say it's going to hit tomorrow or, you know, we're a week from Tuesday, but I have to position the portfolio for a slowdown in the U.S. economy um, on some level a devaluation of the U.S. dollar. I mean, I think the Fed is going to have to help us get out of this banking situation uh, by lowering rates. And I think that has implications for U.S. investors. I think it affects my uh, interest in finding international investments. I think about the impact that has on commodities, um, not just energy, gas, and oil, but also precious metals and industrial metals. Um, so that's helping to frame the portfolio construction process and, and frankly, owning companies that I think are recession resistant, you know, those that will be able to endure this slowdown. Um, it's a little bit of a balancing act. I mean, I think the recession is going to be here, um, but this near-term risk on appetite is also fairly easy to understand as an investor when rates are going to have to come down. Um, there is a sense that the Fed's going to back off, and that does move investors into um, growthier, more risk-on type assets. And that's the obligation and responsibility I have as an active manager. How do we get from point A to point B? How do I take a portfolio through this period of volatility? where I can see a case for equities to lift here in the near term, but all of that from my perspective is underpinned by this view that we're gonna to have to have some margin contraction, potentially some multiple compression, and ultimately a slowdown in the US economy. Yeah, so your two strategies, and, and, and for those listening, we're gonna focus on the long side and then um, talk about uh, CBLS, um, in the context of the short book um, and the later part of the show, but there's an overlap um, between the two on the long book. So that, that the interesting part about the long book, as I see it, Vince, is yes, it's global. Yes, you can go anywhere, but the overlap to what else is out there in the ETF landscape is only 13%. I mean, that's remarkable because you can go anywhere and you're a high active share too. It's a very interesting combination, especially in the context that you've, you cover as a universe, 4,000 names. So, so talk to us a little bit about how you've come down to the, the holdings that you own and, and screen through 4,000 names. Yeah, I, I appreciate that uh, observation, Dan, and, and nobody knows more about the ETF landscape than you. And if you're, if you're highlighting that overlap as being exceedingly low, um, you know, I, I take that to heart. And it's, um, it's interesting because we do have a wide mandate. I mean, one of the things um, that I felt really sincere about as an, as an active manager, um, asking investors to trust me with their capital over cycles was to say, look, I think I benefit, I think we benefit from having somewhat of a generalist's perspective. You know, the idea that we can invest on anything that trades on U.S. exchanges, 
So we can find ADRs, as you mentioned, international exposure. But it is effectively the 4,000 plus securities that trade on U.S. exchanges that are eligible for investment in the ChangeBridge ETFs. And that's a lot of names to get your arms around. And I think um, the tools that I use to, to do that include quantitative screening. So these are not quant products. I don't let uh, quantitative factors indicate to me what looks like a buy or a sell or a short. Um, but as a practical matter, I think many of us in the active management side of the business are, are thinking about some of the factors and, and data points that will help us cull through that universe, right? Processing a lot of data in real time, reducing some of those behavioral biases and saying, look, what's jumping out is interesting. So if nothing else, the quantitative tools help to screen that universe and direct the fundamental research. That's where the bulk of the analysis occurs, right? I go from from 4,000 eligible investments down to only about 30 to 40 long positions. That enables me to be incredibly picky, you know, to, to exercise a lot of um, security analysis and discipline. Um, and it results in a portfolio that's high conviction. Um, but the blend of those things is what I think is, is really um, exciting for me, right? Is to say, you know, where are we in the market cycle? What do we feel about the economy? Where is capital flowing, profit cycles, credit cycles? Let's use some of these quantitative tools to direct the research. And having done that for, you know, for many years now, um, you build a mental model and a framework for different industries and businesses. You get comfortable with management teams. You learn how to access a lot of research and data points and build financial models. And you say, look, out of those 4,000 companies, um, these are the types of names that are really interesting for me you know, at this point in time. And then building the conviction around individual securities results in this high conviction type portfolio. And I do try to more or less bucket the exposures into the few areas of, of focus. Um, so when you have these factors and data sets and you say, look, this is where I think we are in the economy and valuations, um, you end up in certain sectors or areas of the world or, or uh, you know, certain uh, dynamics of a business that you think on some level, maybe they're just idiosyncratic. There's security selection um, you know, kind of characteristics that make an investment really compelling or interesting. And maybe it has nothing to do with the macro environment. They're just building something, creating something, creating value, um, potentially going to, you know, have, have returns for shareholders that make me want to be an owner of the business. Um, so it's really that, that kind of accumulation of, of things. It's, it's comprehensive, Dan. I think, you know, I'm probably, um, you know, painting this picture, hopefully of a really flexible mandate that's guided by a market awareness and that leads to fundamental security analysis, and then a portfolio that's really tightly constructed to, to provide hopefully alpha over cycles and, and high conviction and that low active share, uh, the high active share and low overlap that you alluded to. So before I drill deeper into the portfolio, I forgot to ask you, yeah. how'd you come up with ChangeBridge as a name? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, there's, uh, there's a, a history there that has to do with, um, you know, an upbringing and kind of a, a home um, to one of the founders of the firm who, who grew up in a, in a place referred to as Change Bridge. But I think the more kind of broad um, messaging around that and the symbolism around that, that that we thought was really interesting is this idea of bridging some of the tools that have, exist, have existed in the investment landscape for many years and kind of, you know, that idea of taking um, tried and tested in many ways practices like fundamental research and, you know, doing valuation work on securities, and then bridging that into this ETF landscape. So kind of that, um, that transformation of taking hopefully the best of everything we've learned and continue to learn in our professional careers, and then thinking about the way we can apply that for modern investors. And sometimes we use um, the phrase that, that ChangeBridge manages active ETFs for modern investors. So bridging that space between, you know, tried and tested uh, fundamental research, but making it more available in a modern way, the transparency, liquidity, tax efficiency of ETFs specifically. Love it, love it. Um, so um, we've talked a little bit about the broad market. Um, break down your portfolio in the context of maybe three or four um, uh, categories so people get a sense of things. Yeah, happy to do that, Dan. Um, you know, I think of them as buckets. I mean, sometimes we're um, we're blurring the lines between securities that might exist in in more than one bucket. You know, they have different dynamics. I mean, every every security really is its own story. Um, but I do think it helps investors get their arms around the portfolio to think about 
you know, kind of more broadly, what are the things that I expect to see in the market and how we build a portfolio out of those views. Um, I do think this maturation of the United States and potentially a dollar decline is one of the interesting dynamics. One of the big kind of views or calls that we can make as investors right now is to say, look, I, I think a lot of the opportunities internationally are more compelling. And to me, that leads to European securities, Latin American securities, some of the Asian ADRs that we can find where I see better growth prospects at, at frankly, at better valuations um, on the heels of such strong dollar strength for so long. And, you know, predicting currency markets is, is particularly difficult. Um, you know, I'm not trying to be a currency trader within the portfolio, but the broad recognition is that um, as the dollar declines, as we potentially devalue the currency to navigate, you know, some of the situations here on shore, um, I think that's going to help valuations for commodities, right? We talked about um, energy and, and precious metals and industrial metals. Um, but in the portfolio, we've got some exposure to natural gas, some of the, some of the technology companies within the energy space that are going to help with transportation and LNG and um, you know, some of the requirements there around delivery and capture of methane, making sure that these companies are working in a way that adds value to their investor base. Um, but diversifying that even into things like copper and gold, um, I just think broadly speaking, investors have uh, the potential here to get outsized returns from areas of the market that are underrepresented in, in terms of market cap, um, but have the potential to generate significant cash flows. So I'd say that's fully you know, one third of the portfolio right now that I would put in this category of there's just not enough compelling growth in the United States. The dollar has been so strong for so long. Um, that it's time to look outward. And we've been building those positions. Our first energy addition to the portfolio was probably two years ago now, adding Chesapeake Energy as a, as a practical matter. That was kind of our first foray into the energy space and the recognition there's a global supply demand story around commodities that's underappreciated. Um, and natural gas's role as an affordable, um, you know, reliable, and in many ways, cleaner um, source of energy resonated with us at ChangeBridge um, you know, a couple of years ago, we began to build out some of those positions. I think as you flash forward in time, it's become more consensus that yes, indeed, we do need more, um, you know, access to reliable, affordable, scalable, you know, commodities. So that's that, and that portfolio exposure has broadened to include some of the, um, as I mentioned, metals and, and industrial metals that are going to be so important as part of the build out for renewable energy and electric vehicles. When you think about the needs for copper in that sector, it's really um, fascinating. We think about the growth in emerging markets. Um, the need for some of those industrial metals is, I think, really compelling. Um, so that's kind of one broad bucket. And it does include, you know, consumer companies in Brazil and in, in South Korea. So um, if you go through the portfolio, and we, we do list every holding on, on changebridgefunds.com, you can see uh, on a daily basis, the entire list of holdings for both of the strategies, um, you will see that eclectic group of names, individually researched, but, but many of them do tie into this, this kind of broader view on the, on the U.S. economy. Um, bucket number two is kind of related, and, and I kind of, I, I characterize them as recession-resistant businesses. And they may be U.S. companies, um, but I think there's some aspect of the business that gives me confidence that they will do well even amidst an economic slowdown. And some of the examples that are, are more obvious are a company like SCI, in the funeral and cemetery business, right? So um, that's, you know, I, I reason to believe that's a recession resistant end market. They've actually done a great job building market share. Um, they have an enormous backlog at this point of pre-need sales. Um, so that's, you know, obviously the type of business that can generate cash and um, is not a discretionary purpose, uh, a purchase. Um, but even others like Rollins is in the pest extermination business. So you think about the Orkin brand with millions of customers that pay on a monthly basis for um, pest extermination services. So if you run a hotel or a restaurant or in your residence, you're unlikely to forego that cost on a monthly basis, um, even in an economic recession. You know, a company like Bolero, um, the largest owner of bowling alleys in the U.S., that's the, tends to be an affordable outing. It's a good experience for families. You can get a meal. Um, so when the weekends come around and the birthdays come around, you know, Bolero has, has, I think, the potential to be a really recession resistant business model. A company like Domino's Pizza, for obvious reasons, we're unlikely to forego um, our appetite for pizza, an affordable meal with convenience and great technology with scale in a franchisee model, um, even during a recession. So 
I think that's bucket number two, Dan. You know, you've got the, the slowdown in the U.S. It points me outward into international markets and some of the commodities. Um, the slowdown in the U.S. points me to some of these recession-resistant type businesses. And then bucket three, I think, is kind of the most interesting or exciting for me, and it, it's always part of the portfolio, are these idiosyncratic, security-specific ideas, where you have the potential, I think, for outsized returns. You find a business that's maybe earlier in its life cycle, on the verge of some innovation, maybe it's FDA-related, uh, maybe it's technological innovation, maybe it's some evolution, an S-curve in a sector, and I'm able to find a handful of companies at any point in time um, where I think independent of the macro environment, hopefully I'm able to find businesses that are going to provide investors with these outsized returns um, on a reasonable time horizon. And that's kind of bucket number three. I love it. I love it. You know, um, uh, I, I see a lot of commonality in in how I look at companies as well and in, in, in the way you're describing. So the, we'll talk further about the, the stock side, but but before I go there, I wanted to like talk to us a little bit about risk management. You know, how do you scale into a position? Sometimes you're going to be wrong too. When do you know when you're wrong, right? Um, I think this unfortunately are important aspects to portfolio construction. So important, Dan. Yeah, and great question. I mean, risk management is, is such an important part of the process. Um, I certainly have examples of mistakes. And, and um, one of the things that... Uh, you know, more than I'd like to admit, I guess, but we've all, we all make mistakes. But um, one of the things I try to do for our investors is to be transparent and accessible. I just think it's part of the relationship building, part of the process. Um, the fact that I can post our holdings onto changebridgefunds.com every day, run attribution reports, talk about the things that worked for us and against us. And I post that in our quarterly letters. We, we post um, an entire set of holdings, everything we owned in the quarter. What was the weight in the beginning of the period? What was the average weighting? What was it at the end of the period? What was the attribution at a security level? Um, so there's something about being accessible and transparent that I think gives investors comfort. Um, because after all, on one hand, I'm asking them to give me a lot of flexibility, right? To go across sectors and even geographies and find interesting ideas. Um, that demands a lot of trust. Um, but I like to deliver that with this accessibility and transparency. Um, but to your question, operationally, when I think about owning 30 to 40 names at a very kind of foundational level, that's part of a risk management approach, right? I mean, we could find, you know, the 5, 10, 15 highest conviction ideas and make that a portfolio, but you do get to a point of diminishing returns as it relates to volatility. I mean, I just, I, I think the idea of having on average about 3% position sizes um, gives me enough upside. It gives our investors enough upside to say, look, if we're right about something, we actually wanted to make a difference, right? We want to generate attribution from that. We wanted to have, you know, a meaningful impact impact on the portfolio. But to your point, we have to acknowledge that what happens when things go wrong, and you know, and how much damage can we do to a portfolio if a thesis is wrong, or some unforeseen development causes a stock to move against us? Um, I think similarly, that three percent, three and a half percent position sizing um, can help us to to mitigate some of those real drawdowns. You know, I sometimes think to myself, we can have a, a security go wrong and that can give us a bad day or a bad week. Um, but I try not to let a position sizing get so um, you know, out of sync with the portfolio construction mandate that it gives us a bad month or a bad quarter or a bad year. So, so part of that for me is containing, you know, containing the downside, but there is this, this you know, responsibility we have on a daily basis to ask ourselves, you know, is the thesis coming to fruition? When stocks move, do we do a revisit? Do we take a look at price targets? Um, we test our conviction. Is it time to move on? Acknowledge our mistakes, move capital elsewhere. And, you know, it's hard to build rules around these processes because there are times when I see a stock move against the portfolio. Um, you know, last year we had significant drawdowns in the capital market. Some stocks were against us 40, 50, 60 percent, and that's painful. Um, but if I go back to the research, if I revisit with management teams, if I look at my valuation framework and my models and my expectations, Sometimes that's an opportunity to add to a position. So, you know, I think as investors, sometimes it's comfortable to have this idea of like a stop loss mindset or, um, you know, some, some preconceived idea about how much pain we can feel before we ultimately are forced to move on. Um, and there are examples of that, but I really do try to retain this, this um, you know, discipline around just continuing to do the research, do the work. And there certainly are times when you acknowledge mistakes and you move on. Um, but I, I also find opportunities when, and sometimes in the short term, you can be wrong, um, but hopefully in the long term, we actually get an opportunity to add value. So this idea that it doesn't work 
all the time. The portfolio, no portfolio works all the time, yeah. but does it work over time? And, and that's what I strive to do. Now, of course, in CBLS, Dan, we have the short book too. So that's another risk mitigation. And I, and I think that the, the two strategies complement each other. CBSE is a long only total return strategy. CBLS is a long short alternative strategy. Um, so the alternative strategy reflects the short book, and that's 10 to 20 stocks. Um, I tend to have a net exposure in CBLS between 30 and 70%. So right out of the gates, you're getting some diversification, as you mentioned, you're getting a short book, which gives the opportunity to, to generate positive returns when prices go down. You're lowering your net exposure, you're lowering your beta, and hopefully you're also generating alpha with both the long book and the short book. So that, you know, that ETF just structurally and inherently provides some volatility dampening, um, you know, and risk mitigation, just given the, given the mandate. Yeah. So, so, okay. So let's, 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 uh, let's start and have some fun with um, the, the names in the portfolio. And um, I know everybody's um, on the call has read our disclosures, um, read the prospectus too, I might add. Um, but, it, you know, in all seriousness, compliance matters and everything should be sized properly. So having having reminded everybody about that, um, you were talking about gold exposure, you know, but I think the companies that you were speaking about were asset light too. Well, talk to us a little bit about those business models and why you chose that exposure. Yeah, Kim Ross Gold and, and BTG, the two, uh, KGC, BTG, the gold miners that I have exposure to in the portfolio. Um, it does start with that market awareness. I think, you know, at a, at a structural level, we think about the Fed and the implications around interest rates and, and what they're going to have to do, in my opinion, and it kind of goes back to the banking situation. Um, I, I think there are reasons to own gold over cycles. I, I don't have, um, you know, kind of a permanent weighting to gold. I'm not, I, you know, sometimes the term gold bug. I mean, I, I think opportunistically, there are periods where an investor can benefit from having exposure to a store of value, um, such as a precious metal miner, a gold miner. And, you know, I think we're in one of those periods. I, I would call this potentially more of a trade than a buy and hold um, type of a position for, for the funds. But, um, you know, as a practical matter, I think the banks have a mismatch in their balance sheets. I mean, not to tie everything back to the regional banks, which are, you know, getting a lot of the coverage in the mainstream media on a daily basis. But but I think that's for good reason. I don't think we have a deposit issue or, um, you know, necessarily a, a, a solvency issue that, that is tied to liquidity. I think the reality is the Fed moved interest rates so dramatically, so quickly, which was, you know, more or less telegraphed. But um, it took a little while for them to acknowledge that that was the direction we were moving in and inflation was not transitory. But nonetheless, they did move very quickly. And, and it's, my, it's my view and my, you know, the research that I'm, I'm reading indicates that we don't just have a few outlier banks that have this balance sheet duration mismatch issue. Um, this conundrum between holding something to maturity versus available for sale is creating um, a mark to market, which is going to be a headwind for a lot of banks, not just the few that are making the headlines, you know, and so, you know, broadly speaking, if we have more than 4,000 banks in the United States, um, I've seen some research that indicates there could be a couple hundred that have a serious mismatch problem on their balance sheets. And the idea that the Fed or, um, you know, some government entity is going to be able to bail them out individually or collectively, um, I think it's going to be challenging, you know, and, and, um, the outliers that I mentioned, we know the banks that are making news every day, they've either find, a, they, they've have found a suitor or an acquirer, or we're waiting to see if they can find an acquirer. Um, I think that process is taking a long time because um, they don't make for great investments, right? We know that the depositor base can flee. Um, we recognize they've got this balance sheet issue to deal with. And it almost feels to me like the, the self-evident outcome here is that the Fed's going to have to lower interest rates not so much to instill confidence amongst depositors. I mean, they can, they can back up the depositors and they have done that. They'll continue to do that. Um, the question I keep asking myself from a market awareness perspective is, well, how are they going to fix this, this mark-to-market mismatch? How are they going to you know, correct for um, potentially hundreds of banks being offsides because of that dramatic move higher in interest rates? 
well, I think they might just have to reverse course. And, you know, I think that could happen sooner rather than later, where we start to see interest rates come down. Um, but what that partly means is you're going to have a bit of a devaluation in the U.S. dollar, right? And we're seeing that. I mean, the U.S. dollar is down something like 10% um, since September. Of course, it had had an historic run into that moment, but now we're starting to see this depreciation of the U.S. dollar, um, potentially less quantitative tightening or more quantitative easing, depending, you know, depending on how we want to characterize the next steps for the Fed. Um, but I think that points us in the direction of, you know, stores of value, whether it be copper, gold, um, even commodities in the energy sector. Um, so yes, I mean, capital light, the miners tend to have over time more operating leverage um, to the spot price. So we've seen the move higher in gold, the commodity. Um, I think over time, we'll see um, maybe a proportionate or higher move in the prices of some of the miners that have done a good job of, of, running, their, of running their mines and their operations. So that's, that's, a, that's a decent part of the portfolio today, Dan. So it's interesting. You were talking, um, for those um, who aren't aware, um, you know, both on what you were short in CBLS, right, meaning the financials, right, as well as what you're long in terms of what's going to benefit from currency decline, right? Um, it, walk us through some of your holdings uh, that are international that you're long. Because you you know such as sure. LVMH and and uh, SD Lauder because those are very well known companies. They are Dan yeah and I've been following them for a long time. I mean I think you know I, I think about things top down. We've already kind of covered that. I mean I think that you have you know these global multinationals. They're able to sell into emerging markets. They have a global footprint. What I specifically like about LVMH and and SD Lauder, um, if you think about that category, the cosmetics, perfume, fragrance category. Um, there are a lot of kind of secular dynamics there that I think are really interesting as investors. Um, they tend to have a high return on invested capital. Um, those categories tend to be characterized as somewhat oligopolies. I mean, you have a number of players in that space, of course, um, but the market share exhibited by those companies in particular is um, you know, pretty dramatic. When they see emerging brands, they tend to acquire them or they create their own brands. Um, when you think about evolving consumer preferences, and this has been playing out for years now, I mean, these are the types of products that resonate really well online, right? So as advertising shifts online, as we talk about, uh, you know, direct to customer type purchases, um, these are really well suited, right? I mean, they're small boxes that, that ship easily, they have high margins, um, they have a long shelf life, and these companies have been able to create global brands, right? So we talk about some of the scale and synergies that come along with um, digital marketing, div digital advertising, the able, you know, the ability to to land, um, you know, spokespeople and brand ambassadors. When you take that into the world of of Instagram and um, you know TikTok and and bring that online, well, the scale that's that comes along with having these multi billion dollar franchises, I think, just creates really interesting valuation opportunities for investors. Um, and then the uptick from emerging markets, right? Where the per capita consumption of these products is much lower in Latin America. It's much lower in Asia. And they don't need to entirely close the gap with you know, US consumption levels or even Western European consumption levels, but you have all these tailwinds. I mean, that's what gets me so excited as an investor with a lot of flexibility. It's to say, all right, at a macro level, you know, are the opportunities skewing more abroad? I, I think they are. Um, and then you say at a category level, you know, what's so compelling about perfumes and fragrances. Well, this ability to lean into digital global brands, right, with a high return on invested capital, the ability to, to deliver direct to customers. And then you start to build up, uh, you know, a case where you see several tailwinds. And, um, you know, I become very excited about putting those into the portfolio. Those are larger companies. I, you know, I think of them as global kind of multinational businesses. And we also own Carlsberg, the brewer, one of the largest beer companies in the world. So this is not exclusive to you know, the cosmetic space, I think we can find across industries and categories, these dynamics. Um, and then we find much smaller companies, you know, in, in Brazil, I, I, I think it's maybe finally time to own, and I own it in the portfolios now, Arcos Dorados, which um, some might be familiar with. It's the, it's the largest franchisee of the McDonald's brand um, across Latin America. And you think about what happens when Brazil in particular, uh, an energy exporter, is now getting a little bit of a boost in their economy from higher commodity prices um, as the dollar starts to slow down relative to the Brazilian rei. 
Um, and then again, zooming in at a, at a consumer level, this is a you know affordable purchase that um, with huge brand recognition across the Latin American landscape. Um, and you look at some of the things they're doing at a, at a company level. You know, Arcos Dorados is really just now fully integrating things like drive-through capabilities. We're so familiar with that in the U.S., of course. I have reason to think that will work in Brazil. Um, they're introducing more technology and apps for purchases. Um, I have reason to believe that's also going to work. You know, they're doing more with standalone stores. So instead of being mall-based kind of kiosks, um, what they're finding is when they open a standalone storefront in Brazil, now you can fully harness the power of technology and drive-through. Um, so again, it's one of those examples, Dan, I, you know, I, I go from 4,000 stocks to 40. So, so I, like, I like this idea that I can line up the market awareness, a perspective on the macro, where are we in the cycle, what's going on in a specific category, do I think the management team can execute on a strategy, and ultimately, can we get a return for our shareholders? Um, it leads me to a wide-ranging eclectic portfolio, some, some very large companies, you know, I'm fairly risk, uh, I'm fairly uh, adverse or, or um, you know, agnostic about market cap or value versus growth. I just want to find the most interesting opportunities for our investors. Yeah, so so I definitely know about Domino's, and it's kind of a big international franchise as well, and and uh, Dorados as well. I I, I know, um, and your portfolio construction overall is about fifty five, fifty six percent in the U.S. So you're providing a lot of international exposure as as you were highlighting. Um, and I, I really love the whole recession resistant theme. I mean, it's crass, but um, funeral homes are always going to be around. All right. Um, I hope you haven't had to do too much due diligence on the funeral home business, by the way. I've, I've tried um, to avoid that. Yeah, they're good, they're good operators, but um, we'll try. To, I'd rather go bowling than, than be at a funeral home. Go bowling. But, but yeah. But but you're right about the bowling too, and and my daughter is um, uh, now working at the American Cornhole League, by the way, mm -hmm. and and the, the 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 pivot on that is this is about a community. People, I get what you're saying, and it's like you're in a league. Bowling is part of your DNA to some degree, right? You have to go, right? You got to support. So the business is fairly steady. Right. So it's a, I, great, it's a great business. I mean, yeah, I mean, part of it is the leagues. Right. And you do that for a lot of reasons, more than just the bowling. It's the camaraderie. It's the social, you know, outing. It's it's becomes almost like a ritual. Right. And you have corporate outings where it's a great way for for businesses to build, uh, you know, cross departmental relationships and, and team building. You have the celebrations, you have the birthday parties, you have the weekends. Um they actually own the PBA, the Professional Bowling Association. So there's a media play there. They're actually learning how to better advertise and monetize and franchise um, the rights they have to the pro professional bowling um, circuit. So, you know, I get excited about the, the the industry seems like it's doing really well, right? It's um, it, it's also a business model that looks really compelling. There's not a lot of CapEx. I mean, once you build that alley and you put some of the technology in and you you boost the, the menu items a little bit, um, these guys are operating with a 40 to 50% EBITDA margin. Right? <laughs> so it's a great cash flowing business. Um, it's a good value proposition for the consumer. And by the way, they're competing with sort of mom and pop type bowling alleys that they don't have the scale. They don't have the technology. They don't have the infrastructure. They're operating more closely at a 10 to 15 or 20% EBITDA margin. So what happens is Bolero has an opportunity to, to consolidate the industry. You know, they're much larger than their number two and three largest players, um, but they can reach out to a, a geographic area where they're underexposed. They can find an operator that's ready to sell. They buy them at a compelling valuation. They then take the EBITDA margins from 20% to call it 40%. So it's highly accretive. Um, you know, reasons to get excited. And this, by the way, this was a SPAC not that long ago. I mean, it came out at a time when SPACs were generally cast aside and dismissed. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting, I've been able to find a couple of SPACs that um, kind of got grouped together with this band of misfits because they use that structure to go public. Um, and what I realized and learned was some of these companies are really good businesses. They just took advantage of a structure that was kind of the, the prevailing structure at the time to go public. Um, they got, in, in some cases, they got kicked aside, you know, thrown out of portfolios. Some of them went from $10 to $3. And my research revealed that there are actually some really good businesses there. And Bolero is one of those. So, so um, 
Yeah, I, I totally get where you're coming from. Uh, tell us a little bit about joint, by the way, because it, that's that's a far, I would say, more sexy opportunity, perhaps. Okay. Because because and there's nothing wrong with just steady cash flow. I love steady cash flow. Don't get me wrong. You're right. But joint is more of a um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, explosive, perhaps. Potentially, yeah. And I'll give a quick overview of that one. And it's interesting, Dan, you highlight that one out of the portfolio, because that's one of the securities that I think it maybe belongs in more than one bucket, you know, as I think about recession resistant, um, but also this idiosyncratic potential upside. I think joint probably can sit in either of those categories. Um, and the business for folks that don't don't know, it's, um, it's one of the li- largest chiropractic businesses. It's a franchise model. Um, where joint is able to acquire or grow chiropractic businesses um, across the United States. They have now hundreds of of offices where you can go. Um, There are a few things about that that I think are are really interesting. Um, You know, one, from a demographic perspective, our willingness and ability as consumers to seek out more natural remedies or homeopathic type care, you know, avoiding some of the prescription um, solutions that have been prevalent for so long, you know, increasingly we're finding that people would prefer to have natural care, you know, in, in terms of their, their health care needs. Um, so the, the idea of a consumer going to see a chiropractor is becoming more prevalent, more common, um, kind of recurring visits is on the rise. Um, people's willingness and intent to eventually visit a chiropractor is on the rise. Um, it's kind of interesting that on the side, we're spending a lot more time on Zoom calls, right? We're, we're spending a lot more time, you know, our posture reading you know, whether it's our iPhones or, or other, you know, technology, I mean, the need seems to be on the rise. Um, from a demographic perspective, we're, we're aging, you know, as a population. So a lot of things just kind of tie into healthcare and um, some of these services as being, you know, timely. Um, but then you also have this dynamic where, not unlike Bolero, this is by far the largest provider, and they're able to acquire other practitioners. And they have something that's a little bit disruptive in terms of the, the payment mechanism or the business model. And uh, if you're not familiar, Dan, it's, it's, it's more of a subscription model, right? You pay on a monthly basis and, and you receive um, effectively a membership card. It's not that different than going to the gym, right? You step into a, a joint facility. You don't need a reservation. Um, they swipe your card. They typically will give you, you know, an adjustment in, in fairly short order and you're back and on your way. Um, that's proving to be a bit disruptive. I mean, they don't get involved in some of the more serious procedures. They're not involved in healthcare reimbursement. Um, it's more like a lifestyle service that a lot of people are benefiting from with a really good value proposition to consumers with scale. And um, it's also that franchisee model, which tends to be higher margin, free cash flow generative. Um, small company today, I think the industry is interesting. I think their position in it is really interesting. It's been a volatile stock, um, but but yeah, I think that has the potential to do well even during a recession, right? Because it's one of those kind of healthcare, um, not so discretionary purchases, not super expensive um, for the consumer. But lo and behold, if they can continue to take market share and grow the business, I think there's room for that to be one of those, you know, frankly, a fairly dramatic outperformer um, to the upside. Yeah, so so let's bounce back a little bit to how you play some of your themes. Um, the semiconductors, as an example, you know, la- last last time we did this call, again, we, we had Sanjay Devgan here, and he happened to highlight uh, a name that you're also very familiar with, which is kind of cool, because, you know, he's a semiconductor expert, and here it is in your portfolio, too. Yeah, that's, um, I appreciate you highlighting that for me. I love the idea that I'm landing on some of the same ideas as, as Sanjay in the semi space, because he's he's a great investor. Um, and he can go really deep in that space. You know, I think folks are hopefully getting a sense that I, I'm thinking about things more broadly, you know, across different sectors and geographies. And, and, and this idea that I might, you know, I might look at 100 different stocks, and then ultimately find one that I think is a good way to reflect the view. Um, that certainly applies in the semi space. Um, and Indy Semiconductor is one of the holdings in both CBLS and CBSE. And what I think is really interesting about that business is we're, you know, we're all familiar with the, the proliferation of semiconductors and whether it's artificial intelligence or the Internet of Things or um, you know, electric vehicles. I mean, I think, I think there's a fairly high degree of consensus around this view that, look, we need more semiconductors. Um, and there's a secular story there. Within that 
space, which does tend to be volatile, right? It tends to be a little bit dictated by supply, demand, and backlog, and pricing. Um, what I really like about India, which is is a smaller cap company, um, but they are really a pure play on electric vehicles, and they've been able to build capabilities and, and technologies um, to have their chips integrated into many brands and models of electric vehicles. Which means, for me as an investor, I don't need to necessarily predict which you know, which ornament is going to be on the cars that are sold, whether it's a Ford or a Tesla or an Audi. Um, I think we're seeing an S-curve like adoption of electric vehicles. And this is almost like a picks and shovels type of a play within that, right? So as we see the volume and units of electric vehicles go up, um, the components that the semiconductor, you know, well-documented, right? But the, the amount of chip requirements for electric vehicles is high and rising. And here's Indy, this small cap company that's built into a lot of the OEM uh, manufacturing plans. And one of the nice things about being built into the automotive OEM space, um, the original equipment manufacturers, is, is it's a pretty sticky business once you get in there. And my research is indicating that Indy is there. Um, they've beat now, they've been at or above earnings expectations for seven quarters in a row. Margins are expanding. The backlog is expanding. And I think it's a great way to get exposure, not just to semiconductors and electric vehicles, but specifically a company within that supply chain, um, which I think is going to disproportionately benefit. And, and then you're also long um, um, air test systems. That's a similar type of situation. Yeah, that, it's, it's another, I think, really interesting um, investment opportunity that's along in both. CBLS and CBSE, you know, as of last night, which is we post the holdings on a T plus one uh, basis. So um, what what Air does is they're more in the testing of semiconductor chips. So they do have exposure to electric vehicles, but even more broadly, one of the things we're seeing is as semiconductor chips become more sophisticated, more complicated, more valuable, um, more integral to the supply chain. And we have recent experience, you know, during the pandemic to to indicate, um, you know, frankly, our dependence on semiconductor chips. Um, what what AEHR is the ticker. What AIR is doing is um, creating the testing capabilities so that the semiconductor manufacturers, and they've been doing this for 40 years. I mean, it's again, one of those kind of picks and shovels type businesses. Um, they're able to test the chips at burn-in. So when they go into um, the wafer board or into the vehicle or into the appliance, um, they have a technology and a capability to test semiconductor chips at scale um, to find out if there are any defects or any need to, um, you know, to make modifications or replacements. And what they've demonstrated is an ability to land increasingly more customers. Some of the largest semiconductor uh, manufacturers and fabricators in the world are already clients. Some have been for years. Um, but what I think they're communicating to the street more recently is, um, you, you know, kind of uh, accelerating growth in that area. And I think it's for some of the reasons we've already chatted about, right? The, the secular story for semiconductor chips um, plays really well for NVIDIA and, and others. NVIDIA is a $250 billion market cap company. And um, I think there might be investment opportunities there, but frankly, I think some of the mega cap larger companies are going to have a harder time earning a return on invested capital. If we can find companies like Indy, companies like Air that are really in some ways critical players within that supply chain, within that secular story, um, I think that's a better place for me to allocate capital for our investors. I, um, so Jim Carroll asked a great question in regard to um, your long short strategy. And what is the index or how do you measure success for that fund, um, you know, given that's a long short fund? It's such a complicated space and it's a great question. Hi, Jim. Um, you know, I, I do look at the peer group. I mean, that's just one barometer or proxy we have to think about an alternative manager is to say, you know, who are the other long short equity strategies in the space? Um, so as a practical matter, I'd use the Wilshire Liquid Alt Equity Hedge Total Return Index as the primary benchmark for that strategy. Um, for folks that look into liquid alternatives and do some of the work in that, in that category or space, um, one of the realities is it's a very eclectic group of, of strategies and mandates, right? Some are quantitative, some are qualitative, um, some are market neutral, some have leverage. Um, the approach that we're taking at ChangeBridge with CBLS is to own 30 or 40 long positions and 10 to 20 short positions. I typically think about a net exposure of about 30 to 70 percent um, at any given point in time. And, um, you know, as a practical matter, I think what investors want to do is beat a benchmark 
And when you use an alternative strategy, you want to do it with less volatility or less risk. So I sometimes think of a long-term sort of a beta for that strategy as being closer to 0.5, you know, where a CBSE might be the long only fully invested. Think about the beta is closer to one. Um, I think we can do, you know, over the long run, I think we can have about half the beta of long only indices. And the result of that is we are keeping investors in the markets, right? Because it's not, it's not a strategy. One of the things I see in the space quite often is to have a long book that might be interesting, um, but a short book that, that maybe looks like buying puts on the S&P or short the Qs or short the IWM, um, which are broad-based long only indices that it, to me, that demonstrates a willingness and ability for, for an asset manager to reduce their beta, to reduce their net exposure but they're not necessarily trying to generate alpha with the short book. They're just trying to lower the, the market exposure. What we're trying to do at ChangeBridge is to find individual securities with the short book um, that will lower the net exposure almost by definition, but can they also generate alpha? And when I think about how do you benchmark that, what do you do for investors? Well, I do want to outperform over cycles and I want to do it with less volatility. You know, and, and, and there is a reality with short books, um, having managed them for a long time, you know, oftentimes short books can be a headwind. Right? The markets go up over time, equities tend to rise over time. Um, so you want to be really conscious about, you know, I think your time horizon, risk management, being more tactical, sizing things appropriately. Um, but there is this opportunity when markets do become dislocated, when you have more volatility, when you have a big sell-off like we did last year, the short book can really help an investor stay invested over cycles. Yeah, you're, you're spot on having managed a, you know, a hedge fund in my career, it, it, you know, and, and trying to manage that 30, 70% that you're talking about, you know, it gets very challenging because sometimes the junk rally, like, you, you know, just want to like strangle yourself because it's, it's like irrational. What makes you move higher or lower on your, on your short book? Because your long book at exposure is probably pretty static. It's a good point, Dan. Yes. Um, that is true, by the way. Um, I, the long book exposure tends to be more or less fully invested. I mean, I'll be in the high 80s, 90s percent long exposure. The, the variable there tends to be what is the short exposure? Um, not, only, not only that, I mean, it's what are the companies, what are the industries? Do you have more recession resistant type of long book that's more defensive, lower beta, or do you have more of a high flying, you know, higher beta long book? So you can certainly affect the portfolio of volatility with the long book. But as a more practical matter, it's that short exposure. And for me, that's going to be a function of you know, market awareness. You know, where are we with regard to the cycle? Um, valuations at a higher level, thinking about whether the market appears oversold or overbought. Um, but really, again, the bulk of it comes down to that fundamental research. What am I learning from the management teams? When I do work on a company from the short side, do I see a catalyst? Right? You need to have a time horizon around a short book. Um, one, there's this kind of asymmetrical risk reward that everybody's familiar with. You can lose more than 100% of your money with a short book. You know, if stocks go up by more than 100%, you're, you're exposed. So you really, I think you need to have tighter reins around each short position. Um, I think you need to be willing to listen to, you know, kind of what the market is telling you. If, if I'm wrong about a short position, I'd rather be more tactical around that. I'd rather have higher turnover with the short book than be wrong for a long time. There's a cost to borrow as you know, with shorting securities. Um, it's more work. It's a, it's a difficult thing to deliver for investors over time. I, you know, I sometimes describe CBLS, that's my dual mandate fund, right? I have to have the right securities and I have to have the right exposure. And I embrace that. Um, I think there have been enough instances in my career and with, even with the, the track record of, of CBLS here to say, look, you do that work because when you have a year like last year, when stocks are down you know, 18, 20% at the S&P level, um, 30% if you're looking at the Qs or the IWM, Bonds are down 13% um, in a year like 2022. And here's the short book, and it's really able to help investors. Um, so that's that's a full-time, you know, your, your question there, I, I, I'm sorry, that's a little bit of a longer answer, Dan, but there are a lot of considerations with regard to the short book. What are the well, right the names? What's well, the right writing? Yeah, waiting. Well, the, the funny thing about having a short book is it forces you to be also smarter about your long book, right? Because you, you end up being both optimistic on you know listen when somebody buys something they're optimistic you know? but with a short book you're the opposite of that right so now you're looking it's kind of like left and right side of the brain when you're when you're looking at something on the long side and uh you know when you're looking at it on the short side um you, you're hedging what you're long so it's it's almost a smarter way to be invested 
I think when done, when done appropriately and it's challenging. Yeah. I mean, I almost, I feel like I have to have a sort of dispassionate view of the data. You know, sometimes I'll find a company, it's not to say they're a bad company or I don't, I'm yeah. not rooting for the economy or that businesses succeed, but sometimes the market presents opportunities where you say, look on the next earnings, um, given what I'm reading, the data points, you know, I think they're going to have a hard time hitting expectations. Sure. So it, it does come back to an expectations game. It's not so much, you know, being a moral arbiter or saying this is a good company and this is a bad company. It's, it's, Oftentimes for me, it's just trying to define this, this asymmetric risk reward um, proposition. And sometimes you see that with long positions and sometimes you can find that from a short perspective. So um, I'm gonna put in the chat, uh, the charity that, that um, you're involved with for those um, who wanna learn more. Talk to us a little bit about your charity. Yeah, happy to do that. I appreciate the opportunity um, to do that. Uh, there's there's a house museum in Concord, Massachusetts called Louisa May Alcott's Orchard House. And I'm sure many are familiar with Louisa May Alcott. Um, she's a prominent author from several centuries ago, but her work um, still stands today as, um, you know, really a, a visionary in many ways, somebody who um, her her book Little Women has been read and it's been in circulation. It's been in publication now for more than 150 years. Um, and it still resonates with a, a very wide audience of readers um, across geographies, across gender and age and demographic. It's been made into movies. So her, the home that she grew up in, um, this orchard house is in Concord, Massachusetts. It stands as a museum, which it's been for over 100 years. Um, I'm thrilled and honored to, to be part of the investment committee for the Orchard House. So that's one of the associations I have um, with the museum. Um, I'm also raising four children. Happen, uh, it happens to be that three of them are little women. And um, I think that that work stands up as a really great example for them. And um, so I thought that, you know, given the opportunity, Dan, um, there's so many great organizations and charities, but I thought it was timely um, to mention Louisa May Alcott's Orchard House is something that, you know, professionally I have, um, you know, some affiliation, but also personally, I think, I think it stands for something that um, really resonates today. Well, again, I think we have that in common because um, I'm a big believer in helping women because, well, I have a daughter and I really want her to have equal opportunities, right? We, in, but in your case, you've got three. So <laughs> that much more of a reason. That's right. <laughs> we are aligned. But, yeah, Vince, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate your participation in the ETF Think Tank. Everybody on the show, thank you very much for listening. Uh, please check out the website, all right, you know, and check out the ChangeBridge funds. Um, have a great weekend. Vince, talk Thanks, to Dan. you Thanks, Dan. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.